Good morning. How are we doing today, church? I want to do something real quick, kind of kind of old school, but I love to do it. We're all about fellowship here. So I want to take just a quick minute, shake somebody's hand, just a quick minute, shake somebody's hand and say, thank you for being here. We're glad to see you. I love that sound, people welcoming people. That's the way it should be. We're glad that you're here this morning, that you chose to come and worship with us. We are in week four of this series called Red Letter New Year, where we are starting this new year out focusing on Jesus' words. The one that we say we follow, the one that we say we serve, what does Jesus have to say? What are the things that he focused on? What are the things that he emphasized the most when he was here on earth, earth and what that means to us, his church, and what that means of how we should live out our life. And so I, I've, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but throughout this series, I have refrained from using a bunch of points. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Um, you know, in some of my messages, I'll use point one, point two, point three, whatever. But I've kind of refrained. I've kind of laid back from that a little bit. Some of you may like that. Some may, maybe not. But this is the reason. I did it intentionally because I don't want us to leave here every week more focused on a point and more focused on uh, maybe a point that I came up with from Scripture or a point that somebody else that I borrowed from. Um, but I want you to leave here focused on Jesus' words and focused on what he's got to say. I want you and I to meditate on his words and allow his words to change us because that's where the power is. And here's what we found out throughout this series, and you probably already knew this, but um, man, Jesus doesn't pull any punches, does he? Like he never softens anything. He just kind of says it as it as it is. Now he says it out of love. I think the reason he he tells the truth is because of his relentless love for us. And, and honestly, the reason it's tough for us, some of the things he says, is because uh, it, most of it is completely countercultural. What Jesus has to say a lot of times is opposite. It goes against the way that we think and the way we process things because his ways is higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In fact, I think sometimes we, we think maybe that uh, he's even trying to take something away from us, you know, to take our life away. But here's what I believe. He lays out the truth for us, even though it's hard to swallow sometimes, because he wants us to experience life. And he wants to experience, us to experience life to the fullest. And here's the problem. We don't know how to do that, but Jesus does. And this series has been one of those series that kind of builds as it goes, one on top of the, uh, of the other. I don't know if you've noticed that. The first week, we, we kind of read how Jesus always kept his return uh, in the, the forefront of his followers' minds. He wanted them to always know that and to live life knowing that one day I'm going to come back. We read the passage where he told his disciples, he says, I'm going away now, and where I'm going, you can't go with me. But I'm going to play, uh, prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back and get you, and you're going to be able to live with me forever. And knowing that truth, that God has prepared a place, that Jesus has prepared a place for us, should, should motivate us to live our lives differently. And this theme has kind of been all throughout the series. Week two, week two, keeping this in our minds, we looked at the one thing that Jesus said was the most important. Why I'm gone, this is the one thing you've got to do above everything else. The one thing that all the commands and all the prophets hang on. Does anybody remember what it was? To love, right? Love, love God and to love people. Because I believe if we learn how to love as Jesus loves every other issue in our life, every struggle, everything we go through, if we really learn how to love like Jesus loves, everything else will fall into place. Because love is the what? It's the, it's the main thing. Last week we talked about something that, um, that Jesus talked about a lot, but it's kind of an uncomfortable topic for us. Anybody remember what we talked about last week? Stuff! Right? Money and possessions, but we called it stuff. 
And the reason I believe he talked so much in Scripture, Jesus did, about stuff is because he knew that this was the main competitor to our love and to our affection, to our devotion. This was the competitor with him. That the desire to want and to have more stuff would literally drive our lives. And isn't that so true? It does, man. When we look back at our lives, the desire to have more, it drives our career decisions. It really does. It drives our career decisions. It drives what university we go to or whether we go or not. It drives our families. It drives how and where we live. It drives our worship experience or whether we come to worship or not. It drives every aspect of our lives. And I think what Jesus wants us to see is that all of this stuff, in the grand scheme of things, is all passing away. That one day it's all going to be gone, and it's not going to make an eternal impact. It's not even going to matter. It all, it all goes back to living the here and now, that little blip, the here and now with eternity in mind. Living as we're striving toward eternity with an eternal perspective. I finished last week by asking a question, and I hope it wasn't confusing. Here's the question. Why do you work? Y'all remember me asking that at the very end? I asked the question, why do you work? Why do you go to work and you spend 8 to 12 hours every day away from your family? The most of your life is worked away. Why do, why do we do what we do on a regular basis? Why do we keep up with our routines? Have you ever really stopped and asked yourself that question? Throughout the day, why do I do this? Well, what's the drive behind it? Why, what is my motivation? Now here, I, I, want you, I don't want you to get me wrong. Don't get it twisted. My goal is not to make you question your job, okay? You need to work. That's not what I'm doing. I'm not trying to question your job. My goal, though, is this, is to question your motivation, my motivation. Why do we do what we do every day? Do we do it primarily to invest in the world? to invest in ourselves, or are we motivated to work that so that we can invest in God's kingdom and so that we can build God's kingdom? What is your purpose? What is your mission for doing what you do on a daily basis? And here's what's crazy. I felt led that this was the conversation that we need to continue this morning. And what, what's funny is I told Gary kind of early on in the week, I, I told him a direction I was going to go. And then I, uh, as I was reading through Scripture, I was reading some of Jesus' words. And I read across this passage that we're going to read this morning. And as soon as I saw it, and this don't always happen, but as soon as I saw it, I said, this is it. Like, this, this is it. Like, I just heard something say, this is it. This is the passage that you need, need to go. And so we're going to camp out in this area this morning. But let's pray before we dive in. Heavenly Father, God, we pray that you would um, uh, just be with us this morning, Lord. We know that where two or three are gathered, unified together in your name, Lord, that you are here with us, that you dwell in us, you live in us. And so, God, we just pray that you would move in a mighty and powerful way. Lord, your word is powerful. Your word is alive. And God, we are thankful that, that you came down, you sent your son Jesus to die and to live an example and a life of, of how we should live. And that these things have been recorded down. What you said, what you taught have been recorded in your word. And so God, if we say that we're Christ followers, we should pay close attention. All, all scripture is God-breathed, but we ought to pay, pay close attention to what you taught and to what you said. And so this morning, speak to our hearts, Lord. God, we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we read a, a parable, if you remember, from Luke chapter 12 about this man that, that he had such a big harvest that he said, I'm going to tear down my old barns and I'm going to build bigger barns. But we also summarized another parable um, from Matthew 25. We didn't really read a lot of it, but we summarized it. You'll, you'll remember. It was a story about um, the master, you know, that was going on a long journey, and he, and he called his servants in, three of them, and said, I'm going to entrust you with my property. He gave one five talents or gold or whatever you want to say. He, he gave uh, another one two talent and another one one talent. And the master came back from this long journey, right? And he asked them, each one to come in and said, give me an account of what you did with the resources I entrusted you with. Y'all remember that story? Remember it? Shake your head like this. You remember it? 
Well, I want to pick up, and the reason I share that is because I'm going to pick up at the end of this parable where I believe, I believe that Jesus is explaining in real time what this parable means. See, that's the pattern throughout Scripture with Jesus' parables. All throughout, what he would do is he'd tell a parable, and then he'd bring his disciples together, his followers, and he'd explain what that parable meant, the spiritual meaning behind it. So we're going to jump right in. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Matthew 25, 31. This is what it says. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. Verse 32, all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Verse 33, he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Now, if we were to take this passage literally, that one day the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, will come one day He will come in all of his glory. These words right here paint such a mental picture for me. I want you to imagine for a moment. Adults, I know it's hard for us to imagine, but I want you to imagine. If you need to close your eyes, close your eyes, but just don't go to sleep yet, all right? But this is what I want you to imagine. When Jesus came the first time, how did he come? Not a trick question. How did he come? He came as a baby. Sweet baby Jesus. You know, cuddly, crying, and all that good stuff. He's just so sweet. That reminds me of Talladega Nights, baby Jesus, little baby Jesus. And and he came, he came in this humble form. This is the thing, leaving his throne, he left his throne, he left his glory behind, choosing to humble himself and come as a servant to all of mankind. He emptied himself of glory. And y'all, I'm so thankful he did. Anybody else? Man, I'm thankful. But I want you to look at what Jesus prayed, okay? We're going to jump to another scripture. We're coming back. Look at what Jesus prayed before going to the cross. John chapter 17, verse 4. John 17, 4. He prayed this to the Father. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the what? With the glory that I had with you before the world began. That tells me that Jesus himself, he emptied. Before he came, he emptied all of his glory when he came to earth. But see, here's the thing. This second coming that we're reading about is going to be completely different. This passage that we're reading about is a whole different picture than the Jesus that we recognize on the wall. The Jesus that we recognize, you know, in the pictures. The time, listen, this time he's going to come, it says, in all of his glory. This time when he comes, he's going to come with all of his angels. Multitudes of angels are going to come down with him. And it says this. It says he's going to come to establish his kingdom. He's coming to establish his rule. Just try to picture that with me. Just picture, man, Jesus coming down. And it says all the nations will be gathered to him. Everybody. All people will be gathered around Jesus. Mark chapter 13, verse 26 says this. Jesus says, Then everyone, everybody say everyone. He didn't leave anybody out. He said, Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with what? Great and and glory. Great power and glory. Revelation 1, 7 says this. That when he comes in all his glory, that all people, it says, all people will mourn. Christian or not, follower or not, we will mourn. And here's why I think, because I don't think that we'll be able to stand when we see Jesus completely glorified. We will all, every one of us, we will hit our knees, even the biggest man, and completely cry out. Because in this moment, we will truly realize how holy our God is and how small we really are. Can you picture it? Man, can you picture it? Y'all, here's the thing. This is really going to happen. This ain't just a story, man. This is, this is in the future. It's going to happen. And here's the thing. God has, has yet to fail on any of his promises. Do you know that? And he ain't going to fail on this one either. Do you have the picture of Jesus coming in all of his glory? Every people, no matter who you are, rich, poor, black or white, it don't matter. All people are gathered around Jesus. 
And this is what he starts to do. He starts to separate the sheep from the goats. He puts the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Let's keep reading. Verse 34. He says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. Man, that's good. The kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. He says to the people on the right, come on, take your inheritance. You struggled all your life, but you followed me. And so I want you to come and you take your inheritance that's been prepared for you since the creation of the world. Man, can you picture that? It's going to be beautiful. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Look at verse 37. Then the righteous, the people on the right side, they will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And listen to Jesus' response, the king, verse 40. Truly, you want to know the truth, he says? I tell you, whatever you did for the, for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. See, Jesus looks at the people on the right, and he says something that sounds completely weird. I mean, it, it sounds weird. He says, because you fed me. Because you clothed me, because you, you looked after me, come on in and enjoy your inheritance. And they looked at him like, what do you mean, Jesus? We haven't seen you. What have we done for you? We hadn't, hadn't done these things for you. But Jesus said, no, but you have. Because when you did it for the least of these, you also did it for me. When you took care of those that were in need, when you expressed your love for others through action, you were actually, Jesus said, you were doing it for me. Have you ever thought of life that way? Have you ever thought of life that way when you see someone that's in need? That's Jesus. I'm doing that for Jesus. When you and I, when we put our, our love into action toward people, Jesus says that we are actually showing that love to Jesus himself. That, that, that that's him that we fed. That that's Jesus that we took care of. That that's Jesus that we invited in. But here's what intrigues me, though. I don't know if you called it, but it intrigues me. When Jesus comes back in all of his glory to separate the sheep from the goats, he doesn't say this. He doesn't say, come on in, take your inheritance, for you believed in me. I don't see that. He didn't say, come on in and enjoy your inheritance because you had faith in me. It is not there. He didn't say that. He, he says, take your inheritance because you saw me hungry and you fed me. He said, come on in because you saw me thirsty and you gave me something to drink. You saw me naked and you clothed me. Now, when I first read this, y'all, I'm going to be honest with you. It almost sounds like a works-based salvation at first glance. But we know better than that. We, we, we know better than that. We know that's not true because of all the numerous other scripture that point to salvation by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ, period. Jesus is not saying you work yourself into heaven. He's not saying that. He's not saying you earn your spot by doing and doing and doing. There is nothing we have ever done or nothing we could ever do to earn God's grace or his mercy. There's nothing that we could ever do to earn salvation. Amen? Because that's why Jesus had to leave his throne. That's why he had to abandon his glory and come to earth and die. If we could have done it on his own, he would have just told us how to do it. Just take care of it. So, so then the question becomes then, why does he say it the way he said it? Why does he say it to those people? This is what I believe. You ready? Because real faith, real belief, real love always expresses itself through action. Always. We can profess to believe, we can say we have faith, we can say we love Jesus, but how many people know that talk is cheap? James says this, James said, faith without action is what? Anybody remember? It's dead. In the letters, uh, in, in Revelation, the seven letters, in every letter to every church, okay, Jesus always starts out with, I know your, anybody know? I know your deeds, I know your deeds. Every time he says, I know your deeds, it doesn't say, I know your heart. Your heart's in the right place. It, it doesn't say that. 
It doesn't say, I know your intentions, your intentions are great. No, it says, I know your deeds. But, and this is why he says it, because real belief, real faith, real love expresses itself through our actions. Jesus says this to the people on the right. The way you took care of those that are less fortunate while I was away proves your love and devotion to me. It shows me that you love me and you're devoted to me. Come on in and take my inheritance. Now, all that's pretty good, but let's, let's read in verse 41 because it, it, it changes. The tone changes a little bit. Verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. You who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Let me, let me, let me tell you something, okay? We don't mention much about, about hell in church anymore, but it's just a fact. But I'm going to tell you something. Hell was not prepared for any human being ever. We, we, we choose that path. We make that decision. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Verse 42. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. Verse 44, they also will answer the same thing. They said, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or, or sick or in prison and did not help you? Like, Jesus, we didn't see you. Then this is what he's going to reply to them. Same thing. Let me tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for the, for, the, for the least of these, did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Verse 46, then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. How depressing is that? <laughs> Jesus now looks at the ones on the left, and he says, depart from me. You're cursed. But why does he say that? He follows it up. Did he say, depart from me because you didn't believe? There's probably some in that group that believed. He, 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 did, he didn't say, depart from, me, depart from me because you didn't believe. He didn't say, depart from me because you didn't have faith. No, what he said was this. He said, depart from me because you saw me hungry and you didn't feed me. He said, depart from me because you saw me thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. You depart from me because you saw me naked and yet you didn't clothe me. You saw, you saw the needs all around you, but yet you did nothing about it. You just walked on by. I'd never seen this scripture this way. Can you imagine? Here's what we have to grasp, people. If we take this scriptural the scripture, literally what Jesus is saying, that Jesus is referring to his, to his own return to earth, then we have to realize that this picture is going to happen one day. Just as it is written, it's going to happen just like this. And here's what we have to understand. Every single person in this room, including myself, we're going to be the ones that are separated to the right or to the left. And I want us to think of it this way. If our faith and if our belief, if our love for Jesus is measured by, by what we do for the least of these around us, how are we doing? Let's be honest, how are we doing? If our love and our devotion to Christ is measured by how we love the people around us, how are we doing? If this is literal, how are we responding to those around us who are hungry? How are we responding to those around us who are thirsty? Those around us who are naked? Those who are strangers? Those who are sick? Because Jesus is saying, that's me. That's me over there that's hungry. That's me over there that's thirsty. And if you walk by them and you do nothing, then it's just like you walking by me. And that's why I ask the question, why do you work? Why do you work? Why do you invest so much of your life into work? And again, I'm not making you question your job, but what is your motivation? What drives every day of your life? Because I think what happens to us, especially here in our culture, we get caught up of the, in the cycle of the normal routine. I got to do this. I got to do that. We have no focus. We have no vision. We have no mission. We have no purpose. We're not driven. 
But I'm going to tell you something, man. I want to be driven. I want to be motivated to work hard and to earn money. Why? To build my own kingdom? No. To pour it and to invest it into people. Because that's what we're called to do. Not to continue to invest it in my, in my resources that God's given me into Caleb's kingdom where moth and rust and thieves break in and steal. But to invest it into something that really matters. Something that will make a real eternal difference. And here's the thing, what I'm finding out is this. We're not called to just go by when we see somebody on the street corner and hand them a $20 bill. Here you go, just to make ourselves feel better. There's nothing wrong with that. I've done it before, and maybe that's exactly what they needed. But, but, but it's more than that. Our call is this. Our call is to invest our lives, people, to invest who we are, our resources into the people around us. This is not a one-time deal, but it's a lifestyle that we've got to live. It's a mindset that's got to change that needs to take place to realize I'm here for a reason. There's a purpose. There's a mission for me to show the love of Christ to a broken world. And we've got to make the decision that, listen, I'm not here to satisfy myself, but I'm here to empty myself. I'm not here to satisfy and build myself up. And here's the thing. Jesus, do you realize he is the one that led us in this example when he, God himself, emptied himself and became a servant. But yet we don't want to be a servant to anybody. And we are called as Christ followers to live that same kind of life. Jesus says this, and I don't even remember if I put it in there or not. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. One of my favorite passages throughout scripture. It's one of the toughest, but it's one of my favorite. He said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple... You must deny yourselves, deny themselves, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Deny yourself. Take up an instrument of death every day, and then you come follow me. Caleb, now wait a minute. I don't like this. I'm uncomfortable. This is not comfortable to me. Uh, you're talking about something that's radical, living a radical life. But I'm going to tell you something, y'all. I believe the more I dig into Scripture, and especially what Jesus did and what he said, the more I dig, I see that this is what God commands us to do. This is how he commands us to live, to live radically, constantly pouring ourselves out, constantly emptying ourselves to the people around us, giving sacrificially. And I know standing up here today, this flies in the face of the American dream. I know. I get that. I do. I do. But do we want to follow Christ fully in all that he's called us to? Because this is the kind of life that he's calling us to. And y'all, I'm getting to a place in my life, I'm starting to get to a place where stuff just doesn't matter as much to me as it used to. God is really dealing with me on this because I'm tired of building my own kingdom. I'm tired of wasting my, my life just going through the normal routines of, 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 of life and not giving any thought to it. But I want to start leaving an eternal impact. And some of you in this room, you feel that same way. Some of you in this room, there's something in the pit of your stomach. You can't figure it out. And you keep trying to explain it away, but there's something in the pit that just keeps saying, there's more. There's more to life. There's something in there that's saying, look, don't be afraid. Just do it. Don't be afraid to step out in faith. Trust me. I'll go with you. There's more than just your normal. It's time for a new normal. Does anyone else, you don't even have to raise your hand, does anyone else feel that discontentment in your soul? Because I do, man. I feel it. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? We got this discontentment. We know that something's not right. But what are we going to do about it? But here's the problem. Most of us, we're going to do the same thing we always do. We're going to say, amen, thank you, brother. We're going to leave. Nothing's going to happen. You're going to shove it back down deep, and we're going to keep living life as normal. That's what's going to happen if we're not careful. Think about it, y'all. Think about this picture of Jesus in all of his glory with his multitude of angels gathering all the people. And I want him to look at me and say, Caleb, come take your inheritance. 
I want him to say, Caleb, you fed me, you clothed me, you loved me. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Do we really think that we're going to miss out by living that kind of life? Do we think we're going to miss out on this world and all that it has to offer if we start living a little more radically? Do you realize that Scripture says this? It says that we are foreigners and aliens to this earth. You ever read that? We're foreigners, man. That we are citizens of heaven. And here's the thing. If we want our reward now, Jesus will let us have our reward now. Is it, well, hope you enjoyed it because it's, it's not going to last long. It's going to pass away. But here's the thing. For us followers of Jesus, y'all, y'all don't understand. Jesus can give us so much more than we can ever give ourselves. And our reward is eternity. Y'all, I know you can tell I'm passionate about this. And the reason I'm so passionate about it is because the Holy Spirit has really been working on me and my family in this area. I can tell you we don't have it all down. We're not perfect in this area. God is working. But I can tell you this, He's also working in our church to refocus it. He's working in our church to refocus this new year of what we're called to do and what we're supposed to do as a church. Now, I didn't know if I was going to mention these or not, but let me see what time it is. I'm going to mention it real quick. Two things. Two things that we're, we're thinking about trying to do, and we do not have these things planned out yet, but we want to be driven. We want to have a purpose. We want to start living this out, and we want to give you the opportunity to live it out. And so please don't take my word on this because we're just we're brainstorming. At our small group last Sunday, we sat down and we said, you know, how can we live this out? How can we live this kind of life in our culture today? In Acts, the church in Acts, it says that nobody ever had a need. You know why? Because the people in the church rallied together and they took care of one another. There was never a need in the church. Nobody even owned anything. They all shared things together and they were all in one accord. And so with that thought in mind, we don't know what it's going to look like. We want to, to have some kind of, we don't know if it's going to be a board that you walk by every Sunday morning. We don't know if it's going to be electronically over the web, what it's going to be. It might be a combination of the two. But we want to be able to live that out in our church. And what that means is, is that when you have a need, Whatever that need may be, there'll be a, a post you'll, that somebody will see that and you, not the organization of the church, but you, the church, will say, you know what, I'll take care of that need. They need a washer and dryer. I've got one sitting at home I don't even use. I'll take it to them. I'll contact them by phone, build a relationship, and take it to them. Does that sound pretty good? We, we want to do that because that's what we're called to do as a church. Here's another one real quick that we mentioned. And again, we don't have it organized completely yet. We just started thinking through this. But another one is a, a free yard sale. Yeah, a free yard sale. That's good. That's good. What we're going to do is all the stuff. Remember, we got stuff. We got barns full of stuff. We're going we're gonna to empty some of our barns. Stuff we don't use, stuff we don't need. But here's the thing. This ain't just a load off. Well, I just want to get rid of this. And it's broke. No, we don't want that. We want stuff that people can use. We're talking about, you know, clothes and, and furniture, just whatever that people in our community is in need of. And then what we're going to do is we're going to find out by talking to some of our resources in the community who those people are that need these things. And we're going to call them up and we're going to say, hey, we're going to have a bunch of stuff on this such and such day. And if you need it, just come get it. It's free. You just take it and you have it for yourself. That's good stuff because we want, we want to become more of the church and what God has called us to be. I want everybody to stand together, please. I want to take it to a personal level, though, because you are the church. Here's the personal level. What does this scripture that we read, when I read this, man, I, I'm telling you, I read it with a new light that I'd never read it before. When we read this letter, what does this scripture mean to you personally? And what does it mean to your family? What does it mean today? What changes, when you read this, what changes need to be made in this new year in your family to move you closer to this kind of living? And here's the thing, y'all. we got to quit talking about it. We've got to quit having just good intentions that never materialize into anything. But it's time that we start making a move 
And some of us, I know, it kind of makes us sad. You mean, you mean that I need to start giving to the poor and, and I need to start taking care of people? I can barely pay my bills. You know what it might mean? It might mean we, better, we might all start living differently. We might need to change the way we live to do the commandments that God's given us. We may have to, but I'm going to tell you something. You think we're going to suffer because of that? We ain't. Jesus gives good gifts. And he's going to take care of his people. I can promise you that. But he'll only do it if we're willing to step out in faith. So this morning, I don't know how God has spoken to you. There's no judgment here. Only God does that. And so if if you want to come, you want to pray and just say, God, I give it all to you. I give it all to you. Whatever it is, whatever we need to change, then you know the front's always open. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here in your your house to worship together um, as a church body. God, all of us in this room, you have given us talents. You have given us abilities. You've given us resources, finances. You've given us everything we need for the gospel to continue to move forward. God, help us not to be overrun by things in our life to allow stuff to control us. God, you've called us to a greater purpose and help us this morning to realize that. That God, you have something great for us, something you want to do, a way you want to use us, God. But we have to lay everything down and say, God, it's all, all yours. God, speak to us. There's things in our budget this new year that we need to change. We need to scribble out. Oh, 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 let me scribble that out. We we need to use that to give to people because that's where I'm going to store up treasures in heaven. God, if there's areas in our budget that we need to do that, if there's areas in our time that we're making sure we have enough margin to go and serve and to love on people, God, help us to be willing to do it because it's what you've called us to do. Lord, we thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.